we have a lot of people in the waiting room even now. This had been quite fairly a well attended webinar, and thanks to the efforts of a lot of co organizers of the webinar and a lot of interest that it has generated. Uh, it is always a pressure when a lot of people uh, are expecting a certain outcome from a process like this and a political process like this. And, and then uh, many a times people, many a times people expect that this will also bring out a certain framework outcome that, that they would like to see. Many of us come from very different schools of thought and this is an introductory remark, I would say that it's always very difficult among uh, the progressive community to evolve to their positions, also because of the binary, the different kinds of nuances we all quote. Uh, but the reimagining future or reimagining the future evolving a people's agenda for a post-COVID economy, and what we mean by post-COVID is not after we are done with COVID, but COVID has transformed the world. And in a certain sense, uh, none of us can escape the fact that this pandemic has really taken the uh, human race for a task. And it has actually put uh, a lot of questions from the question of economic paradigms that we follow, the political leadership who we, in a certain way, trust in democracies at least, and uh, the kind of, the kind of uh, response that we saw from them. A totally inhuman response from certain governments, while certain governments at least try to do their best in balancing this whole act. But uh, I, I don't want to spend a minute of our time today, I mean, it is my time today talking about this government and the failures. Because uh, one of the efforts here is, or the dual purpose of this whole effort has been in this webinar, to develop uh, a long term vision collectively, I mean, evolve, help. All of our comrades evolve the long-term vision collectively. Not that we have not had those visions when many of our friends started work in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, etc. But at the same time, the way uh, humanity has been you know, transformed or shaken in a, in a lot of ways, how do we use this opportunity to rethink and reimagine this question? Today is actually May 22nd, the day when the Workers from across India have given a call for a protest. Trade unions across India have given a call for a protest. And in absolute solidarity with them, we would like to state that uh, the, the, the workers' cause and the workers' struggle will long live. And, and whatever be the efforts that they are trying to bring in in terms of completely abolishing the labor protection laws that exist in this country, I think. Uh, we shall fight and we shall win. And that, I hope, will be the message that goes out to the, uh, to the larger world today from the Indian working class movement. Uh, in solidarity with them, uh, we would like to start. Uh, I would also like to, being, the, being part of the Pakistan-India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy, it is not easy not to mention the fact that for the last 293 days, we have had uh, Indian occupied Kashmir in that sense now, which is really being kept silent. Unfortunately, most of our Kashmiri friends from Indian administered Kashmir are not able to join today because of the simple fact that they do not have internet worthy of joining a Zoom talk or even watching it on Facebook. Uh, reduced to basic minimum Stone Age existence uh, of, of a 2G, slow 2G network. I would like to express my solidarity with the people of Kashmir who has been fighting this battle against. Uh, since August 5th, it has also taken a new shape, as all of you know. Okay, uh, I'll get into my task now. Uh, I, I do see about close to 100 participants. This session is a larger perspective building exercise on the question of livelihood and dignity. And uh, this is the third session in a row. The webinar has saw its inaugural session with uh, a, a very high profile and important panel, including Professor Prabhupada Patnaik, uh, Dr. Vandana Shiva, and the Finance Minister of Kerala, Dr. Thomas Isaac. The second panel took the conversations about reimagining the future in terms of people's alternatives and political questions as well. Uh, it had Dr. M.G. Sahayam, 
Mehta Patkar, uh, I mean veteran uh, thinkers and leaders together, Ashish Kothari from the Vital Sangam and Kalpoti, Asim Srivastava, who is an environmental ecologist, I mean, uh, economist, uh, who has been uh, was a very, very powerful voice on the day of the webinar. Uh, but today, in, in, in the course of the evolution of this process of the organizers trying to put this process together, we, we also decided that we will have uh, the livelihood session itself. First, the labor session got distributed into several uh, small, uh, smaller things according to the political significance. Now we have decided to also split the livelihood session into the first session, which is today, which is about reclaiming and asserting livelihood with dignity, especially on the questions of Jal Jangal Jamin land, forest, and water. Uh, the, the pursuit today will be to actually give an opportunity for our esteemed panel, uh, but also the resp I mean, respondents or the, or, the, or the participants in this conversation to look at uh, how do we see livelihood with dignity? How do we reclaim that space? Um, how do we make sure that uh, what, we are, what we are going towards through this pandemic and the crisis that is there how do we move towards a more meaningful life, more, more qualitative life? And I think that's, that's the question that's in front of us. Uh, it's, it's, it's a heritage because today what we are dealing with as, as natural resource-based communities is also a question of heritage for a lot of them, not just traditional in, in, in a certain conservative sense of the word. Uh, I would quickly introduce my panel and, and my role here. Uh, I'll start with Ilango Rangaswamy. Uh, Ilango Anan. Uh, Ilango is, a, is an inspirer, instigator, a creator, and has given birth to amazing processes like the Panchayat Academy in Tamil Nadu, which now is a network of almost more than 600 panchayats in the state, but also he has really expanded his empire of Panchayat Academy now to several other states too. He works very closely with the research government like many others. He was an elected uh, Punjab president for uh, almost 10 years time when he opted out and decided to dedicate more of his time for the Punjab Academy as well as the whole process of net network growth economy. You will hear about uh, that today a lot more. He's someone who was a chemical engineer, comes from uh, Kudambakam village in Tamil Nadu, where, uh, I mean, his own struggle from his childhood deep battling against, uh, you know, violence against women, uh, which is also an outcome of the alcohol in the community. To a lot of things, I think he has really evolved a lot. He um, started this whole trust called Trust for Village Self Governance. He was Man of the Year by the Week in 2013. So, a man has a lot of uh, credits, uh, and we are very, very honored and happy to have him go serve with us. Um, Jesu Ratnam Jesu, for many of the people, at least the activists in this room, and does not require much of an introduction. Uh, more than 35 years of work amongst fish workers, the fish fishing communities in Tamil Nadu, Nagapatnam. She's the creator of the Coastal Action Network. She has been a founding pillar for uh, many processes, including the National Fish Workers Forum that she represents today. The National Fish Workers Forum is one of the biggest social movement trade union uh, combinations in the country that has existed for the last more than 40 years. Uh, she has been very closely working with especially fishing women uh, who are both faced with the, 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 the social question of violence uh, and uh, discrimination being from fishing community, but also the question of patriarchy inside their families and society and even movements. Many of them. Welcome, Jesu, for uh, joining us and, and thanks a lot for being here with us. Uh, Roma, who is uh, replacing her own comrade, uh, uh, Sukalu. Roma and Sukalu, both of them belong to the All India Union of Forest Working People, as many of you know. Roma is uh, one of the tallest leaders at the national level of the union. She's one of the uh, co-creators of the Women Land Movement in the, in the, in the northern Indian states, especially. Uh, I don't know whether she has been in jails more than the time that she has spent outside, uh, from National Security Act to all sorts of uh, uh, political sub, uh, submittee methods have been used on the whole movement. Roma has been both a victim and a fighter of uh, the sort. 
she has grown and evolved with other women leaders like Sukalo, who uh, could not join today because of the fact that uh, it takes a long way for her to get to Robert's Bench where she could access the internet or, or use the technological facility. It was in the first place a challenge for us to have someone like Sukalo come in into the Zoom. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, but we are very, very grateful and, and thank you, Roma, Robert Roma, for joining us. Uh, Roma, as I said, is part of the Holiday Union of Forest Weapon People, it's with the General Secretary as well as the National Secretary of the New Trade Union Initiative. Uh, welcome to Sagari now. Sagari is, uh, so yesterday I was asking Sagari for her, uh, a brief that she would like me to put across. Uh, because of the simple fact that people like Sagari who have done a lot of amazing, inspiring, creative work, uh, I can attribute a lot of things that she might not want to hear. She's a veterinary scientist. Uh, started like that. Was very close to animals uh, in her childhood. Uh, is a member of the Food Sovereignty Alliance India, and she heads the Pop Education Program at the Kudali Learning Center in Telangana. So that makes all. I mean, three of our panelists come from South India, which is something that I'm very, very excited about because when you create national webinars like this, it's difficult to make sure participation from other regions. So I think we are definitely making an effort towards that. Sagri, this, uh, the science and facilitates transformative popular education processes for social justice, food sovereignty, and Bjorn Weber. Uh, those who know Bjorn Weber as a South American uh, political thought process that means the well being but also the quality of living of the community. Uh, so she works with Dalit OBC, Muslim Adivasi youth a lot. Um, she has also very closely worked through this alliance with the pastoral Adivasi communities and other small marginal communities. Um, she's been an ideator on uh, pastoral community issues from a very different perspective uh, uh, of not the traditional understanding of the word pastoral. So I, I stop here now. I, uh, my role is pretty much over. Uh, I would request that the first round of discussion be what I refer to as your own opening remarks. This is a session where both your philosophy as well as your economic perspectives are very, very required. I think we have a golden opportunity in terms of redefining and reimagining the future, as the title says. Uh, the livelihood question is in front of you. But I think the first eight minutes, each panelist, I would request uh, in an order of uh, Sagari to start, Ilangoan and second, Roma to go third, and Jesu to come in uh, as the last speaker in the first go, then we can. Uh, conveniently keep shifting that. But just a quick set of uh, announcements that are fundamental for me as for the moderator's role, which is that this is a Zoom conversation uh, and the webinar series called Reimagining the Future People's Agenda for a Post COVID Economy is part of a larger process to initiate debates on alternative economy. And this is put together by a lot of social movements, groups, and trade unions together. Uh, some of the lead organizations, especially the facilitating organizations, Center for Financial Accountability, are very, very grateful for your openness to have opened up this whole thing. Instead of just running an organizational webinar, you opted to make it a much larger collective and a process. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Zoom instructions, also because this is getting translated in Hindi. So the column says, uh, the box says French. Uh, well, that's a Zoom international setting. Uh, please keep your microphone muted. Uh, most of you will be muted until you uh, have the demand for it. You can send in your comments, questions, etc. on the Zoom chat box or the comment section. Uh, um, this is on the Facebook Live, but this is also on Facebook Live. Uh, the Hindi translation is available, as I said. You have to mute the original video and select the language interpretation option in the front for that. Uh, so I think. It's, uh, this, this, the past two webinars can be watched on, uh, online in the center of, uh, page or on Facebook. Uh, this, I really look forward to today's conversations. Uh, and thank you all very much for joining once again. All the participants, now I see crossing to about 120 participants. Uh, and also let's, Sagri, you go first. Uh, thank you, Vijayan, and thank you to this platform for organizing, I think, what is a very important set of conversations. 
um, at the outset, Jai Butali greetings and in solidarity with the workers' uh, resistance and struggle today. I think this pandemic for us in the Alliance, it really was a moment of, of you know, if it's like putting a magnifying glass to something which is already there. It reaffirmed for us and validated for us an analysis of this society that we are living in at one hand, but on the other hand, revalidated for us the vision and our own praxis. Um, as a movement, we have to have a vision, we have to have a praxis. It revalidated those elements. And so at the outset, I'd like to say that when this last two months, we jumped in into relief response because obviously there was a lot of distress amongst the communities where we are in and where we are located in Telangana primarily and in Andhra. And I just like to highlight some of those aspects. For one, those in distress, the ones who needed the food and who were in hunger, who were in at verge of starvation, were undoubtedly the landless. And landlessness, both in rural and in Adivasi contexts, in the Adivasi, amongst our Adivasi communities, it was a roughly around 15 to 18%. And in the rural agrarian economy, it was, we're talking about close to 20% of communities who were landless, who didn't have food because they depended on the daily wage labor. These were also the communities who were being told, you choose between hunger and the pandemic and go out there and work on NREGS to work to earn your livelihood without any kind of protections, giving them work which you can never maintain those kinds of physical distances if you're digging and if you're doing the kind of micro irrigation tank renovation work, which was what was given to them, despite all the kinds of the, the, the PIL and the Supreme Court saying that, you know, give people advance payment, pay them in advance. So just pay them in the fact that you they have deemed work. But no, you give a starving landless daily wage, pay, wage person the choice between hunger and dying of a pandemic because there is no way that you can maintain that kind of physical distancing. The second aspect, which again got reaffirmed very strongly was that amongst both in the rural and in the Adivasi communities, those small marginal farmers who have rededicated, and of course, in the case of Adivasi, there's a long historic history and a culture and a spiritual kind of relationship which they have enjoyed with and, and nurtured and sustained with the entire uh, with earth, with their territories, those communities who have constructed their food system, their, their system of cultivation with centralizing food as the intent. That means that they had lots of, they had stored food, they had saved their seeds, they have their own breeds. They had food security, not only at their household level, but at the community level, because there are still reciprocal ways of sharing in the Adivasi community. And in the rural area as well, those few small marginal farmers who had actually reorganizing or in the process of reorganizing their cultivation so that food is the central element, that you grow and cultivate diversity of food based on your ecological region with your seeds, with your local animals, with your animals as traction. These were the communities who were relatively less distressed. In fact, they were more secure. And then there were, of course, the small marginal farmers who've got into commodity production, meaning regardless of whether you're growing rice or regardless of whether you're growing cotton, regardless of whether you're growing vegetables, it is primarily as a form of cash that you're selling this into longer and longer supply chains. And what we found was the longer the supply chain, the more insecure that community was. And so, for instance, vegetable sellers, vegetable growers in it's about 100 kilometers in, um, in, Telang in Medak and Sangaredi, supplying their vegetables through local santas or local markets coming and selling them. They could no longer do this, but in turn, what did the state do? And they were not collectivized. The state sent in um, uh, food uh, metros like, you know, you have Metro Carry and Cash, you have more, you have supermarkets like that, who went in there and made a killing because people had no bargaining power. So they could buy off these vegetables at really, really cheap prices and come back to Hyderabad and then, of course, sell them. Coming so essentially what it shows that, that when you get into a commodity, product, a commodity production and then you're dependent on 
and, and this holds true for whether it was a food, which is a vegetable or a grain or a cereal or cotton, or whether it was any form of meat. So let's come now to, you know, looking at the whole animal sphere as well. So what we found was that within our alliance, there are collectives of small marginal farmers who have collectivized their, their own, say, milk production and selling it to nearby towns, 20 kilometer distance. This is an example from one of our alliance members in Chittur, for instance. Now, they didn't have any breaks in their, in their entire, um, in their enterprise, in their collective enterprise, because the supply chains are very, very short. So they were able to, without much disturbance, continue to, to have this relationship between their produ as producers with the people they sell their milk to. But in the same, very same villages, those farmers selling their milk, for instance, to either dairy processors who are cooperatives or who are private dairy processors, these are people whose supply chains can be as long as, you know, selling the milk to in Delhi, for instance. And they got seriously, seriously affected because all those supply chains just broke down. And what this again for us reaffirms is that when communities are producing and they're organizing as collectives, you organize as collectives and your markets have to be as localized as possible. Similarly for beef, in the beef markets, the beef markets, particularly in some of our South Indian states where beef has not yet been banned, the beef markets continue to function because you're talking about old animals which are sold and then which are slaughtered and then people can continue to eat and buy that beef. These were least affected. As far as the, at the other spectrum, migratory shep, uh, pastoralist, right? The, 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 the conventional connotation of when we think of a pastoralist is someone who's completely dependent on their animals. Um, of course, what happened was that we were getting calls and we have, there are groups, members of the Alliance who only are their formations of pastoral shepherds. They were getting calls that we are stuck. Now, what was the nature of that, of that disturbance? Essentially, pastoralists have reciprocal relationships with settled farmers. And so when the lockdown happened, pastoralists were no longer allowed to, for instance, enter the village. And the relationship is that if you pen your animals on farmers' fields, in return, you'll either be paid in cash, for the urine and dung, or you will be paid in grain. So that suddenly broke down. The second element was drinking water. Now, fortunately, you still have systems in place where then the farmer said, okay, you can still access the bore wells and for your own uh, drinking water and for the water of your animals. But then when it came to selling their sheep or selling their lambs, for instance, um, that's where then traders, you know, traders who go to pastoralists and then buy the animals and then they're sold into coming into the towns, for instance, those got disturbed. However, what is very interesting is that traders, the small traders who work with the shepherds, they came up with systems such as they said, okay, we will, we have bought your animals and usually you pick the animals up immediately, but they said, we will pay you for that additional labor that you put in to rear your animals. So, what comes out again very clearly for us was that, that the, the entire system actually just revealed itself in terms of the structural injustices which have either been there for 4,000 years, i.e. the caste system, or have recently occurred in the last 30 years of post-liberal, the, the expansion of the capitalist system of production in both, whether it's livestock, whether it's food, whether it's a system of cultivation, the system of production. And what we also saw, for instance, was a huge increase in violence against women. And this was bizarre because you have this situation of everybody confined, increased violence against women. But fortunately, and this is something which has been so important for us as an alliance, our work of working for the last couple of years on political education with youth from these communities, really, really, it showed itself, revealed itself, because you have these young people there who were there on the, as essential care workers, ensuring that they could respond to the discrimination against women to ensure that you preempt any form of stigmatization, be it on the basis of caste or the basis of religion, given the kind of Islamophobia, you know, environment that was linked to this pandemic, that these Bahujan Adivasi Muslim youth as themes were out there in their villages 
to preempt and to respond so that you can, and it has been because we worked on this. It doesn't just come that, you know, you have to, what has also been reve very revealing for us is that because in particularly agrarian society, caste is such an, even between Dalit, OBC and Muslims, unless we have consciously worked at, at working with how do you break your biases and your stereotypes about one another, for instance. So what does that mean for us as the vision, as you know, we're talking about for me, the COVID or future pandemics, they could be there, they could continue, but it speaks about, I think what it did was it took off a veneer of disturbance and we could see things clearly. It reaffirms for us that without land struggle, without a really strong land rights movement, which somehow just has fizzled out, you're going to have, and largely it were Dalits, and other production-based caste groups, such as barbers, dobies, potters, carpenters, who have never had access to land. And without this land reform, we can never talk about building resilience, because land ultimately is so, so crucial for this diversifying, being able to be resilient. So the question of in Adivasi areas is that, of course, Adivasis have the, the power through both legislative constitutional protection to actually assert their power over their territory. And they have got a long world, uh, 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 their worldview, the Bwin Vivir world, worldview, which you find regardless of whether it is Adilabad or the Chenchu um, uh, Adivasis in the Nalamala. Now, for, as far as the Chenchu na, uh, Adivasis goes, it wasn't the pandemic which necessarily disrupted them. Their lives have been disrupted They've, through twice having been displaced with dams through intents to creating these huge national parks and sanctuaries, through intents of continuing. And in fact, while the pandemic going on, they continue to have the surveys for the uranium and the gold mines. So Chenchu Adivasis, whose, whose resilience is based on hunting, gathering, and a bit of food production, has already been disrupted. So it's not necessarily that the, the pandemic just is, it provides you that view, right? So as far as the Adivasis, it's this reassertion over our, of, over our land, over our food, over the systems of governance. You can kick out the corporations. You don't need to be doing cotton cultivation. You can kick them out. You can build your own food resilience, your own food system, your own sovereignty. As far as the, what also comes out very clearly that in the small marginal in the agrarian system, along with land rights, a very strong land rights movement, those who have land, we have to look at the countervailing power. What do you finally possess? You possess your labor, you possess your land. And are you going to have this land, alien, your labor and land alienated to corporations? Because it's the corporations today who are controlling the seed, the, the inputs, the pesticides, the chemicals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to, the countervailing power is about taking back control, about taking back to centralizing food as the basis of your production. It's not got to be money because somewhere if we get, and then how do you pool your labor? Because labor is so important in terms of reciprocity of labor relations that have to go hand in hand because reciprocity of labor relations is critically core to food production, the diversity of food production, controlling your seed, controlling your breed, and then controlling your markets. And when we talk about those markets, it's talking about localized systems right decentralized localized systems where your distance your it's we, are, we can't no longer be talking in terms of chains it's got to be small small webs with link up together and this Agri, is uh, yeah sorry yeah. just i'm warning about time okay, so about yeah. 11 12 minutes now yeah oh, okay so i will maybe and i think that here is where caste comes in so strongly so importantly the bahujan dalit communities, when we're talking about the political education we're doing, it's not to say, it, it is to say that you can equally be a, a farmer of your land, a defender of your, a grower of your food, and at the same time, be an educator, be a scientist, be whatever, 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 right? But it does talk about the centralization, re uh, the vision is that food is central, and it's food from your local. So can you talk about food cooperatives when you're doing food production between the land, between people who are in your village? And then it is as you start building upwards, right? Finally, that this has given us an opportunity for looking at health, you know, 
I mean, we've just ignored the fact that we have privatized the healthcare system completely, whether it's livestock health or whether it's human health. And today, let's not be fooled that most viruses or most of these pandemics are emerging from highly industrialized systems of livestock production. And fortunately for us, we still, so how do we keep, even in the livestock sphere, right? You have pastoralists today who are con feeding concentrates to their lambs so that they can fatten them faster and sell them earlier. Now, this is the kind of rethinking, the re-reflection as to how do you reorganize so that you keep, you keep kind of breaking these links to these corporate chains, to these industrial systems of production and take back control. And therefore, in the health and, and food and health are so, so critical today. So it is a moment for movements like us to come together to really talk about that public healthcare system, which we all just ignored, whether it's the health of the animals or health of the, of the humans, it's public healthcare today, which the pandemic provides us an opportunity to re-engage with and not just leave it to the, you know, the, the, the healthcare movements, because health at the end of the day is concerns all of us, right? And, and so I, I think that we are talking about this new form of economy, Adivasi economy, which is built on their worldview, which is built on their self-governance. And then you have this agrarian economy with all these relationships. And finally, it is about how do you re-relate and re, uh, re, re kind of you turning it on your head. You're not producing just for money any longer. You have to keep the centrality of food and then its relationships to whether it's the land or the forest or as, in, as people, as people, you know. And I think that um, we are really, what reaffirmed for us is that our, our praxis of political education with the youth and with women is finally what is going to make this vision a reality. Yeah, I'll end there. Okay. Thanks, Agri. And sorry for uh, interrupting no, no. in between. I know that it always... Danyavad yeah. uh, Sagri ji. Uh, thought process. Uh, but uh, I think a uh, couple of very serious questions there. Uh, uh, I, one, two I questions have come. Okay, so uh, the reciproc I mean, the reciprocity of the labor is an important question that Sagri has uh, thrown up. I would definitely request Ilangu, Ilangu Anand to come on, on that point as well. Uh, all of you come with diverse experiences, diverse experiments, dreams that you have been doing. For almost 35 years, Ilangu Anand, you have been part of, uh, uh, part of this experiment of you know, what has now become Panjayat Academy as well as the network economy. Uh, over to you, Lango, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, next to the, the, the previous speaker, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, I've been uh, uh, talking even in these days uh, for the past 50 days and particularly for the past two weeks, uh, people started talking in this webinars and even direct meetings and all. Uh, though things are locked down, the markets are locked down, the companies are locked down, the offices are locked down, but uh, something is not locked. Despite the locking down is happening, despite everybody sitting in the home for the past two months, but people are eating. The food is there. Food is at front of your uh, home. Uh, uh, the vegetables are there. The fruit is there. The, the greens are there. Tirelessly, these are made available, not because somebody has uh, you know, prayed something and uh, 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 dig something and uh, they, they brought it. Somebody is constantly, continuously working in the fields. That is the farmers or the, the people in the villages. They are tirelessly working in their field. And that is uh, the vegetables are coming, the grains are coming, the, the fruits are coming. That's why despite two months of time of this locking down, lockdown, but you are not bothering much. Maybe you may be bothering about the money, you may be bothering about when to start my company, how to generate money, that kind of thing. But your life is saved because of the food availability. So now it's a high time. People can easily understand uh, next to this uh, Sagari sister Sagari's uh, talk, food is the central one. Food is ensured. It may be food, uh, any type of food, maybe a grain to for, uh, vegetable to fruit. This is ensured. That's why the humanity of this kind, this country, more than 130 crore population, they are not uh, you know, uh, starving or uh, there's so much trouble is happening because food is ensured. So this is a starting point. Now it's a high time to make the people to realize 
food must be the central point ensure food if the food is ensured that means the grains are ensured vegetables are ensured greens are ensured fruit is ensured milk is ensured for some more time maybe another two months or three months or six months or one year the whole country will not bother about anything it, it, it there there may not be much botheration so that's why the anchoring point is food and again where the food is available where the food is cultivated naturally the land naturally the villages naturally the working class maybe the farmer landless or everybody they are the prime people prime energy prime source prime machine who are responsible for making food available for the country so in uh, after this pandemic or anything economy if someone wants to strengthen someone wants to revitalize someone wants to reconstruct the construction process should start it should be anchored in villages it should be anchored in land it should be anchored in the labor available in the villages that kind of thing has to come the second one is I, you know i've been i've been watching all these things for the past 41 60 easily i can say 45 years i am seeing what is happening actively as an activist as a as a person who is working on the local economy locals uh, the gandhian economy all these things i can easily say that at least 30 years i'm seeing the the economy of permanence i'm seeing the the value the the strength of economy of permanence based on uh, not because gandhi gandhi has not invented this economy of permanence this was the economy of the system economy of this country so gandhi has given some kind of light on that so in the name, in the name of economy of permanence this 30 years easily people this this pandemic has given us the chance that local economy the the producer the consumer and the distance between the producer and the consumer if the producer and consumer they are kept in a in a safe distance what is the distance it may be five kilometer it was five kilometers or six kilometers those days now it could be 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers so that's why here 30 kilometer radius of people it may be 20 villages or 30 villages if they come together and if they are happening to sit in their own villages arrive and understand the potential of them potential of the resources available potential of the mankind potential of the labor available potential of the skill available in that village and what is their strength if they are able to sit and arrive and again if they are able to sit with other villages maybe a neighbor village maybe five villages six villages so ultimately a, a 30 village uh, network of about I, I i worked out in my own research for 25 to 30 years i found the viability of the economics is around uh, 1 lakh 20 thousand people population or 30 or 35 panchayas of tamil nadu size or six or seven uh, panchayas in kerala size so that kind of 1 lakh 30 thousand population if they come together sit together and work out a methodology they can arrive a beautiful self-reliant zone self-reliant zone first is the basic the anchoring point is the food there is a self-reliance in the food production beyond that the other skills maybe the weaving maybe the metal works maybe the carpentry works maybe the earth works maybe tiles making all these things the the the, the whole need of uh, uh, the, the the need of meeting uh, the needs like uh, roti kapda bakan based needs if these things are uh, sorted out and there is a possibility of meeting at least 80% of the needs within that network. Then, automatically the nature has given the opportunity. Scientifically, when we do analysis, there is a possibility of producing uh, the 40% of that is enough for the network. The remaining 60% is a surplus automatically. The surplus will go to the next network or the surplus will go to the nearest town where in the nearest town, the food is not available. The cloth is not available. The lungi is not available. But there is knowledge. There is some metallurgical work. There is some electronic work. Based on that, that urban uh, place or the city place, there is a resource. And that resource will be bargained with this local resource. 
then automatically there is a chance for uh, increasing the power of people, bargaining power of the people, bargaining power of the landowners, bargaining power of the people at the grassroots. So this win-win situation, creating the bargaining power for the local producers, that is possible. So for all these things, interestingly, all these 35 years, from Gandhian ideology, from the Gandhian small, small Gandhi Sarka based experiment, I have tried, or we have tried, many people like me, we have tried a variety of appropriated technologies. So, Charka, now Charka is a yeah, identity, Charka is a symbol, but Charka is modified, Charka could be modified, not killing the opportunity for the labor. So, modified with energy, modified with bearings, modified with some kind of drawings and all these things. So modified charka or modified agriculture machinery. It's called, I can say, we can say that appropriated technologies. So appropriated technologies, community gathering, community sitting together and analyze their own strength, understanding the inner strength of the community potential, then networking villages, networking the towns, then it, it comes around uh, this 30 to 50 kilometer radius as a network of uh, economic zone. This kind of thing uh, is very much possible. For that, I, I, I was doing a lot. Started Then the, the anchoring point, again, the, the point to be understood is, who will say, uh, Sagari and all the people, many people, oh, we, are, we are working with the communities, but uh, what is the structure for making the community sit to, to sit together. In the case of tribals, it is different. But tribals are uh, some place, say maybe 30% or 20%, I'm not sure much of the, 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 the thing. In Tamil Nadu, like South India and many places, the structure available is the panchayat. Naturally, the panchayat is a constitutional mandate and uh, again, little modified and scientifically developed system. So the panchayat is, a decentralized governing system, a simple viable uh, 6,000 population or 7,000 population. The system is again a democratic system. If this is activated, if this is really, though that 25 years are gone, if this is activated, if this has been made as a viable, real delivering system in the villages, yes, the micro government is there. Naturally, network of 20 or 30 micro governments is very much possible and empowering the individual, every individual micro governments to understand their own strength based on the local resources, based on, based on the local skill. So automatically these micro governments of 20 or 30 panchayas can really emerge as a, a big economic power. So that was the idea, but unfortunately, except Kerala, uh, to some extent, and uh, uh, it has been tried in uh, uh, Karnataka, to some extent, it was really growing in Tamil Nadu. But now, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu has gone again because the political wave has eaten away the, the emerging power of the franchise. Whereas, we have to, the world, in fact, I can say, though I am not born in Kerala, the world has to come and sit in, in Kerala and understand. And now the franchise are very powerful. It may be this COVID-19 pandemic or it may be a disaster flood or it may be landslide. The community is strong. The Kerala, the panchayats are strong. Panchayats are strong means uh, not the panchayat system. The people are strong. People are coming together, sitting together in the Gram Sabha, Ward Sabha. Every thousand people or two thousand people, they sit together. They understand what is going outside, what the people are telling outside, what is possible by us, how much we could understand, how much we can react. That is the reaction of the Kerala people from Ward Sabha. Gram Sabha, the Panchayat, Gram Sabha, then a lot of things are done and every Panchayat is a local self-government. That's why Kerala, people are not calling Panchayat. It's a local self-government of Kutambakam, local self-government of Karamacheri or something like this. This local self-governments, mm. they understand. They, they are all, again, interestingly, the educated people. What the CM talks, the Gram Sabha waits it, Gram Sabha understands it, Gram Sabha reacts. The CM is receiving, PLCM is understanding. So there is no much load for the CM, much load for the collector, because people are strong, community is strong. That's why interestingly, the panchayat system is a beautiful system available, 
which is a local self government it's a local government it's again a democratic system so it's a it's a high time to revitalize strengthen the panchayat system and again my my sir, uh, yeah, yeah i'm finishing okay. i'm, I'm minute, finishing yeah. the my my narrative is uh, the towards self reliance and again uh, as a sister uh, sagari was talking the self reliance if you go and sit in the villages the pandemic or the locking down that has not affected the villages because the food is there their aim was their food that the house was a, a small brick based simple house they need a power even that power is uh, supported by solar and other things and a beautiful self reliant community can be revitalized strengthened so that's why it's a high time to work in the villages now go and sit with them making them to sit together understand their strength supporting them for energy and other other appropriate technologies so making the village village as a production base making the village as a consumption base the surplus of the network of the villages will be available for made available for cities then cities whatever the strength of the city can be bargained by the village economy village commodities value added it should be possible it is very much possible because whatever comes from the villages whatever comes from the the grassroots they are essential without that essentials other other things cannot survive it may be looking at liquorative or big big thing but the essentials has uh, the essentials have got the power to command and revitalizing the, the local economy grassroots economy will have the opportunity to command even circumvent all the difficult difficulties all along we are facing that's where the great potential is available thank you very much alanganan um, very critical questions uh, of course you know because of the fact that your work has actually been a lot on reinventing uh the strength of local network economies and and how do you bring that into the uh, 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 countering the so called gdp based centralized growth model into a decentralized growth model uh i would definitely come back to you and ask you some more fundamental questions on the philosophy of livelihood regeneration and i think that's a that's a critical question i saw the comment by thomas franco comrade thomas franco here saying that well you know this session is on livelihood and dignity uh, i would request the speakers to refocus on that um, i would actually defend my speakers and say that well uh, both of them have actually definitely dealt with the larger question of uh, building uh, uh, reimagining the future i mean post covid economy but from a reimagining livelihoods point of view uh, roma uh, from the all india union of forest working people goes next i have a slight request to all the speakers one is that we we are all consistently overshooting time but at the same time also go a little slow because translations are going on and the translators were struggling with the first session and the first speaker and the and little bit with uh, ilango sir too so i would request roma and jesu to keep that in mind the translations are simultaneously happening in hindi hindi mein and what sandra sat sat so i would request that uh, speakers keep that in mind um, uh, roma over to you uh, i would request that again as the opening remark kindly keep it to 8 minutes but also uh, keep in mind the question of the philosophy of uh, livelihood with dignity and reclaiming that from the forest land women's movement that you have been part of uh, thanks vijayan uh, it's very really difficult though to be part of this technological conversation not really used to it very scared of it first of all i would uh, like to uh, uh, comment on the, the this uh, the amphan that cyclone that has affected the coastal zones and especially the sundarban areas and it has really devastated a uh, large uh, tracts of forest and people's homes and they are really in bad shape <clears throat> and livelihood devastated and uh, secondly uh, the uh, red salute to all the workers who are uh, really facing this pandemic more than any of us and they are again they are actually reclaiming their lost political space by not admitting this the coercive and the uh, dictatorship of this regime and they are walking back to their roots 
and they are going back to their livelihood centers. So coming to this issue, it's very important, the, the topic that I, uh, it has been kept, it, has, it is a very, very relevant issue in today's time. And this was anyway, like we were expecting this crisis to happen. And that's why we formed our union, All India of Union of Forest Working People. That is essentially the core is working on the livelihood issues. And that is basing on the natural resources ownership of, that is we feel that these are the means of ownership of, the ownership of, uh, ownership of means of production should be in the hands of the community. The livelihood resources that generate, that generates and it can, and uh, it can secure the lives of millions and millions of people, that can only be happen if the livelihood um, is secured at the vast level. And that we derived this, uh, uh, we derived a slogan that we said that Ajivika ka adhikar, manav adhikar hai. That is the livelihood uh, right, is a fundamental human rights that we derived from article number 21 of our Indian constitution that talks about right to livelihood. So the right to livelihood is very basic since we were working in the forest area and this sense and this education we got from the community, especially from women. Uh, the first conversation when you go in the villages and the, they, they first of all, they said that we want rozgar. Rozgar is not in the terms of wage, but they mean rozgar in the form of livelihood. And they said, they say that if we have a livelihood, if we have our um, land, forest and water, and if we have access uh, over and control over these, we can educate our children. We can give them better uh, health. We can give them better education. So this is what uh, the whole philosophy is around the livelihood. It is just not uh, providing food because the workers here who are going back traveling 2,000, 3,000 kilometers, they said that we don't want food. We want livelihood. We want uh, rozgar, so that we can fend over all other things and live with uh, life with dignity, as Thomas Franco has rightly said, that digni dignified life, it is also one of our constitutional right, that we have to work, right to work with the dignity is very essential to the livelihood. The second thing I would like to come on the issue is that uh, across this whole capitalist regime and by following the new liberal policies after 1991. This whole issue of livelihood has been thrown under the carpet. And the very much issue related to the livelihood is the concept of the, the core issue of the agrarian reform, distribution of land to the landless, to the tailors who are cultivating the land and who are dependent on these natural resources. These issues were very much relevant in the independent in the struggle of independence India also. And that's why the Zemaidari abolition, the Landlordism Act was abolished across the country and it became a constitutional provision that nobody in this country can become a landlord. And all the lands and the production resources should be in control and should be given to those who are living, living on it and those who can produce and those who can uh, earn livelihood and enjoy a dignified life. But this whole kind of the core issues were thrown back. None of the, the, the independent, after independence, the political parties were no longer interested because they were all ruled by big zamidars. So they were not interested in doing, in, uh, uh, you know, in doing the land reforms. And that's why the Land uh, Lord Act, land, uh, the Zamidari Abolition Acts have also, if you see across the states, they have been, you know, kind of manipulated in favor of the big landlords and zamidars, and barely 2% of land has gone to the landless and landless people. So this is one very core issue that it has to be addressed now. And we feel that we have been working in this issue since last 30 years. And uh, our core, uh, very founding uh, uh, organizations, as you said, uh, uh, that I'm part of a trade union initiative, also new trade union initiative. Before that, it was 
uh, 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 an unorganized sector a union called the uh, National Center for Labor. And I derive from our veteran uh, comrade, Comrade Thangappan's uh, view that he, in 1992 and 93, he came forward and he talked about building of these workers' um, uh, collectives and organized workers and in the forest sector, which was the most difficult of all to organize and to build a kind. So that, that concept of whole livelihood was uh, brought into that, that we need to focus on this because the livelihood issues, the, uh, the core issue of the um, um, forest and the uh, land, they cannot be treated as commodity. So because they are now treated as commodity, they are going for projects, they are going for big capitalists, they are going for companies, they are going, the feudals are appropriating it, the um, pastures are going, going in uh, private controls, the uh, uh, ponds are being encroached. So all these uh, issues are very much as uh, Comrade uh, uh, Nango was talking about the panchayat, but panchayats are fractured. They are being manned and controlled by the upper caste people, as Agri was saying. So they are have to be, you know, this encroachment, this control of land and the resources. This is another very big fight that has to be fought at the local level. And the livelihood, the, those who are dependent on it, how they are going to uh, get access to all these resources, they are very very big question. Now the kind of the reverse, the ghar wapsi of our uh, dignified workers who are going back, how are they going to fall back? It is unseemingly that they are going to come back into this uh, monstrous city which is not even, you know, treating them as a dignified human beings. So there are the tensions, they know that in villages their livelihood is secure. They have food security as our previous comrades uh, speakers have said. So they are very much sure that if they go to back, they will not die of hunger. And that means dignity also. Going back to their village means that they are want to live a dignified life. So it is uh, actually a very different, it's a concept and it has to be uh, worked in favor of uh, commod uh, commodity versus property. It cannot be treated as property. It, it is uh, the livelihood is not a commercial item. It is not a commercialization. It's not a property. A land is not a uh, subject of you know. It is. It has to be uh, for the livelihood protection of the vast million of these people. Today, everybody is in lockdown. Even the big people, those who are in the capitalist world and those who are elites and they were all in, uh, but their basic thing is as uh, Ilango has said that they are uh, uh, arranging food. My nephew is a very young fellow. He, he, he was, you know, once uh, just before was very much talking about, uh, I want to earn money this, I want to go abroad, I want to do this thing. Today he's saying that we need to only arrange our basic things, the food. We all, we, we, our whole energies will go into that. So this is a whole shift. Uh, the um, 130 million people, and especially the workers who are uh, coming back to the villages, they are talking about livelihood options. What are the livelihood options? They have refused to stay in the cities. So this is one very big area, which is has to be reworked and rethought about it. And in, uh, given the experiences, uh, we have felt that, um, as you know, and uh, we have been working on the collective also, uh, many lands have been reclaimed. And it, it does, uh, this lands reclamation movement started in uh, various areas that we, our union works in uh, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, uh, uh, and Madhya Pradesh, and um, all these states. So it was uh, started much before the Forest Right Act came. And they have reclaimed, yeah, I will stop in two minutes. And they reclaimed the lands. And today we find that those areas, they are managing the many clusters are being managed by women. Some 200 acres, some 500 acres, some 1,000 acres. They are saying that we are not uh, fearful of uh, hunger. They are uh, fighting with the hunger in this amidst the lockdown. And they are saying that we are capable of feeding the hungry people. 
and just before 10 years, I think in 2000 and 1999, when we were working in these communities, especially the tribal and Dalits and all the backward communities, they were not even able to fend for themselves. Today, they are in a capacity because they are they got these lands, they reclaimed those lands, they they uh, worked on these lands, they um, made them productive, they had a lot of food stock uh, available for all the community people, and they are negotiating with the uh, government. They are collectively bargaining with the government, and their collective, collective political consciousness has increased so much that they are not aware of any violence. The, so many violence has taken place, and so many have, uh, have but they are sticking to, to their issue of the livelihood that we want livelihood, we want our land back. I will come uh, back to uh, how, you know, this issue is more challenging in coming days. So um, uh, I, yeah. I will stop here in the first round. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, Roma Ben. And thank you for uh, assertively being a little slow so that our interpreters can go uh, okay. Uh, I think we have had a lot of conversations around land. Uh, Jesoka, you are the only uh, representative in this panel who will talk about the water, I mean, in the sense of the oceans and, and the sea-based livelihood. But um, also the whole, whole question of oceanic livelihoods has gone through such transformation that the government has now comfortably started talking about what is a, an anti-ocean exercise to be a Sagar Mitra. And, you know, when you're destroying the ocean, that is known as uh, Sagar Mala. Uh, Jesoka, your primary thoughts on the question of livelihood from the fish workers, fisherwomen's perspectives. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, to start with, as uh, I was just listening to what uh, Vandanashu was speaking the other day, she was mentioning about farmers without uh, farming without farmers and food without farmers. So I would like to uh, quote here, say here, yes, we have come to a stage in fisheries also. There will be fish without fishers, and there will be fisheries also, fishing activities also without fishers. So that we have come to that stage. Um, so when we think of uh, reimagination or revisioning, then we have to track to the history that how fishing economy itself was so sustainable. And before the introduction of uh, Norwegian uh, technology, in the year, I think it is 1970, uh, when the Norwegian technology 1960s was introduced um, by our own country, in, uh, tying up with Norwe Norwegian inputs and uh, other global in the, uh, inputs. And they introduced modern gears and slowly it shifted to uh, bringing in the mesh size, managing the mesh size. And then the trawlers, deep sea trawlers came into being. And so it was all World Bank funded also coming with World Bank funds. And we have slowly then introduction of person income came. And uh, um, now, uh, after that, we, we have fought against the deep sea fishing policy itself in the year 1990s, along with the National Fish Workers has formed a joint venture when the joint venture initiatives came. It has formed an alliance with all the fish workers movements, both mechanized and uh, artisanal and uh, small scale fisheries. And they fought against it, uh, against the policy. Now we are, it was uh, in that sense, that, the, that period, the industrial aquaculture, aquaculture was also introduced and it was introduced as a, and considered as a boom for the uh, economy in fishing. And that was severely fought by and opposed by both the fishing community and the farming community then. And even Vandana Shiva has written a good book on it. And there were uh, litigations filed by the Jag Jagannathan and Coastal Action Network supported. And now we have reached the stage where um, this greed, that when we were sustainable, we were made to fish for greed, for the export market. For the, the export market was created for certain species like shrimp, squid, and others. And to feed the 
uh, international market, Japan, EU, and America, uh, for their uh, uh, protein need. And our fishing community were made this, uh, to uh, fall into the trap by giving high subsidies loans in the beginning. And they, they have become almost uh, now uh, for the uh, to involve the unsustainable means of production by fishing using destructive gears and technologies. Now they have become almost a victim to it. And now from this uh, stage, uh, in this stage only, now Sagarmala was introduced as the next phase of revolution, brew revolution. And also now our own government is saying, our state is saying that there is no fish in the sea. So why go for capturing? Why live on the coast? We will invest the everything in the culture fisheries. And there is a, um, input for and su subsidized loans for hatchery units to uh, bring in seeds for the uh, shim culture and the shim industries and other forms of culture also, crab and other. So now the uh, aquaculture has expanded its own uh, area of production by industrial way of production by seeds and, um, and feed also. So both. So the chain is very well established now. Now they are saying, well, you, you fishermen have to go for fishing. In this context, now COVID came and COVID has stopped all activities. COVID-19 has stopped all activities. Even small scale fishers was not allowed and uh, other fishing activities were also are not allowed. Selling was not allowed. The whole um, women, uh, the women who are dependent on this fishing economy for vending and their livelihood were stopped from that and they lost their livelihood. And there is an estimate saying that um, nearly uh, the loss of marine fish production since lockdown has been estimated at 6,700 crores per month. That means the export market has collapsed and the chain is cut and there is no uh, landing of fish in the harbors and even the fish landing small centers. And uh, before, in, uh, before COVID last year in 2019, exports averaged about 3,600 crore per month. And so this figure clearly indicates the potential loss due to pand pandemic uh, disaster COVID. Now, so in this context, now we are thinking of, now we have to look into the, not only small scale fisheries, the fishing sector has transformed itself uh, to such a great extent by the policies and other things, uh, which involved deep sea vessels and they employed a large sector of migrant workers from other states. So now the industrial form of, and uh, bigger fisher vessels in, involved a very big group of migrant workers, uh, both not only in the uh, vessels, not only in the fishing boats, big, big boats, but also in the ice plants and the allied activities along the coast. So these migrant workers, basically, they did not come from the fishing community or the coast living community. They were brought from other states, farming community, tribal communities and others, and they were uh, serving the need of the uh, uh, economy and they were also uh, uh, placed us as workers. When COVID came, they were they were all, they lost their livelihood. They had no place, many places they were not able to move also from their, to their own land. And they were kept there for, so they had to struggle a lot to reach their land now. So this is another situation. And women, as I already told, they have lost totally their livelihood and uh, uh, they had nothing to, now our government itself is saying that in this context they are saying, now they are bringing in, now we have to link this with blue uh, economy and the Sagarmala projects in India. State is saying, now, uh, this is, we, we, you have all projects along the coast. The sea is there. The sea is not for the fishing community. No more it will be for fishing. It has to be shared with all the other industries. And you, that is the, that is the norm and the industries are being promoted. We should just look into the legislations which were uh, passed during the lockdown period. All the legislation spending and the policies were very, very, very quickly passed 
and without just by, by the parliamentarians and it has been had a great effect on fishing economy and the livelihood of the fishing communities now so now now saying go, state uh, the big uh, fishing activity they they have told that you can go for fishing yes we are going fishing communities are going for fishing but not the supply chain is and the uh, market chain is not uh, uh, linked so they have to fish for themselves now so they are fishing for themselves and the sub uh, uh, to a small extent they are uh, coming to the domestic market also the cheap protein which was not available for the communities were now, now available and um, in this context we have to also remember about the policy of mariculture mariculture uh, is pushed as an alternative because there is no fish in the sea so there is a culture fishery is not only in the land but also in the sea to uh, create 1 kg of fish in mariculture you need 6 kg of feed from like sardine anchovy and other species and also to create uh, to create or produce produce 1 kg of protein you need 6 kg of protein to be fed then the 6 uh, kg of protein is poor people's protein like sardine and anchovy is a um, domestic uh, market fed Uh, fish and uh, that is being taken away by the industries now that also so um, we have to now link with what how do we revision revision we were sustainable we were self uh, sustained community but all these now the agree we, we are fishing for and our fishing technologies has been changed and everything has changed and now Uh, even speed boats we use speed boats up to 600 and 700 horsepower that is it is not allowed and the entire technology and the crafts and gears have changed and the mode of production also has changed and now we are we are put in a stage to look into our traditional way of fishing you have to fish with the traditional crafts only small motorized boats and fiber boats now and uh, Uh, without any mar uh, linkages we are not able come fish fishery sector is not able to market and how do we uh, in this stage we are talking of reimagination and revisioning yes to bring back that it's really it's not that easy but the communities and the unions and the movements have to uh, rethink because even if you go in this mode it is fishing is not going to be in our hands Uh, there may be there are di discussions about bringing in uh, technology robot robot to manage the fishing deep sea vessels vessels itself if it is uh, if vessels uh, are managed by robots what is the need of fishing crew there is no need that's what i told there will be fish in the market but fishers won't be there there will be fish in the market and the fishing community won't be there to fish and the fishing laborers won't be there the migrant workers won't be there to be on the coast and who are dependent on the livelihood so far so uh, we are towards that move so to regain back we, yeah we, yeah to regain back what we what we uh, there are small initiatives here and there like the forest and we have fought our own land and still the land holdings are there with the communities in certain places for fighting for land and sea is a major struggle going on within the movements and alternate initiatives like small producer groups here and there like uh, in kadalur there are initiatives by the women fish workers there uh, to involve to gather collect, to cultivate them and involve in production in nagapatnam also there are initiatives and similar initiatives are there in different parts and the uh, for these groups the whole pro problem is marketing because the market economy of fishing is really controlled by big uh, merchants and so how to intervene as cooperatives or collectives is uh, should be the thought process as well as how to reduce or do away with the, all these destructive gears by uh, introducing the other means but state government has told in this covid also that they are giving uh, a compensation which is not at all a compensation so let me come again thank you this is a situation how we should revision bring back and a sustainable economy model 
among the fishery sector. Thank you. Now, one more point, governance. We had a good governance system. We are still having, but it is totally taken away by the industries and the bringing in new um, bureaucratic structures. So that also has to be regained. Thank you. Thank you, Jisoka. I know it's very, very unfair as uh, when, when we are organizing a two hour online uh, webinar kind of a format. First of all, people have to be giving a lot of time from their uh, mental framework itself. And all of you have to be speaking to cameras or machines, which is not the best thing to do. And our apologies for that. Uh, our COVID apologies for that. Uh, but at the same time, as most of you said, I think one of the things that uh, I've been thinking about is that the the damage seems to be a lot more coming from the lockdown in the sense of how it has been done. Uh, the crisis looks definitely more from the lockdown induced authoritarianism than from the uh, from the pandemic in a certain sense or from the virus. But on the other hand, you have powerful experiments that are ongoing in the ground, be it in the forest areas where you know hundreds and thousands of women are managing thousands of acres of land and cultivating or be it the pastoralist community that Sagri spoke about or the agriculture workers or uh, as uh, Jesus spoke about the fishing community and the crisis because it's no more a, a romance, romantic situation where it's just the traditional fishing community using their traditional fishing gears that are going in. Greed was officially taught. Greed was taught to communities through so-called performance measures of the Indo-Norwegian project in the 50s or, you know, the, the upgradation that happened later. And then they have, then the people are called greedy. You know, when we have dealt with, you know, the arrested Indian fishermen in the Pakistani jails, the bureaucracy often comes back to you. And, and, and actually, the Prime Minister of India actually made a statement about it saying that, Itne lalchi kyu hai? why is that our fishermen are so greedy? that they often cross over into Pakistani waters despite the threat of getting arrested. Now, this is a system-infused, profit-oriented, commercialized greed that is inserted into a community that has operated. And then you blame the entire community at the base of it. I don't want to uh, take any time. We are already running late. I had promised all my panel that we will actually go for a second round. Uh, I will request all of you to uh, look at the questions in the chat box. But uh, I would actually like to start with you, Ilango uh, Anand, uh, because, I mean, there are some questions that have come in. But also, I think I surely missed out on the question of, uh, for example, you know, you, you, you have worked with the political class. You have worked with uh, a very corrupt Panchayati Raj system in the state that you belong uh, people have commented on that in the in the in the question session question uh, chat box too. Uh, and the corruption is a big issue, but so is caste, and you have fought that uh, in your framework. Uh, but on the other hand, you are also trying to work with the Odisha government on the one hand, trying to build you know uh, villages around Bhuneshwar, for instance, in an experimental work with uh, the Navin Patnaik government. Uh, you, you've already, already made a, a statement to me yesterday that you're actually going to be devoting more time to Orissa than Tamil Nadu now. Uh, and there is a collective to take forward your Tamil Nadu work. Quickly, uh, how do you look at the Panchayat Academy in a certain sense, uh, which is also addressing questions of the society, which is addressing questions of the environment, as well as economy? How do you expect that to get uh, transformed into... Uh, a very centralized governmental model because post COVID, what you're seeing is a very, very centralized governmental model uh, where decentralization, okay, everybody is uh, happy about what is happening in, in Kerala or, you know, really uh, a lot of applause for it. But at the same time, you're not seeing serious ground momentum for decentralization in most of the other states. And that is the ground situation that we have in hand. How do you uh, particularly address it? Uh, there are a couple of more very serious questions that have come in. Uh, this, is, this is a part of the exploration that we are doing collectively. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether we'll have all the time for taking up all the questions, but at the same time, I would like you to start with this, uh, Ilango. Panchayas corrupted system, not only in Tamil Nadu, except uh, that's the same thing. In 1992, it was passed. 94 Kerala captured it and the same kind of thing hap was happening in all the other places. 
Kerala, because of the people's movement, led by the you know the famous uh, people plan campaign, uh, the present uh, finance minister uh, was leading that, and uh, the Kerala was equipping the people for Panchayat Raj. So that's why when it was implemented, then the beginning before the Panchayat election were uh, elections were conducted, people gathered. and the gram sabha the village plans street plans uh, block plans everything was prepared and people were very keen in systematically approaching that and uh, the, the plan was there once plan was prepared people come to know oh god this is implemented well then what is going to come from the government what the people can offer what the community can offer everything was discussed in a ward sabha and the gram sabha and it's a people plan emerged the success of kerala is not for the not only the system the political awareness that is one side other side huge work happened but in the other case like tamil nadu and all the people say they, it came in 1996 to 2001 lot of things happened because of that government but uh, corruption in the panchayat system panchayat is where is the role model for the panchayat for the role model for the panchayat is the mla the role model for the panchayat is the state government state government chief minister is everything like that panchayat is also the panchayat president is everything that kind of thing and people have not understood the power of democracy gram sabha people sit together it's after all the village panchayat we sit in the gram sabha we sit in the ward sabha talk to the village people that kind of understanding the, the power of democracy that was not happening so the, the government the state governments they were driven Uh, okay, money is given, spend it. Money is given, spend it. It's all concrete, brick, mortar, and uh, uh, and something like that. No, that the people they fail. So that's why examples like Kutumbakam and uh, there are about 129 panchayats in Tamil Nadu. They emerged as a model for variety of things for uh, inner uh, strength of the community, inter cooperation of the religions. In Ramanathapuram, few panchayats emerged as a beautiful model for. how muslim communities can work with other people so that kind of models happen but there was no proper cooperation from the state that why that why it has gone so what i am trying is 20 years have gone panchayats have gone now everybody is talking one of the panchayat is one of the worst corrupt system what is the alternate available that's why in tamil we used to say ஒன்னுமே <laughs> what is the responsibility given to the youngsters the citizens so that's why if the panchayats are good panchayats are powerful panchayats are really panchayat leaders are good and uh, that awareness is there this will start from there and another important thing i just in one minute one, in a second i am telling the the greatest strength available the st- resource available is the strength say uh, jeswaka was talking about uh, the fisherman community yes let the fishing grow fishermen fish it for themselves for some time that see that you know we don't want to fish for others we want to fish for ourselves tomato grow in farmer we he is going to grow tomato for the village only or the neighbor village and brinjal like that the local community let them produce let them have the stand that you no know, let us stand on our own then automatically without tomato other fellows cannot live for one year other fellows live for for one week that is why what my mantra i used to tell from gandhi and all the power of the people tomato cultivate eat have something to store that storing is the technology now we have got a beautiful solar uh, operated refrigerators every farmer can hold it or the community can have 20 uh, tomato uh, uh, refrigerators keep the tomato for another one week or 10 days then automatically the market automatically the urban people automatically the nearby people they will come to you if we sit and discuss if we sit and discuss the strength is available the people are available and that is the way we have to demonstrate 
always we are afraiding about corporates who is the corporate how long the corporate corporate let him come and fish you don't buy that then only the corporate thousand people can eat all the fish available in there so the community is the larger base of the, uh, the bottom of the pyramid is with us we have to empower them we have to make them to stand on their own that is where the sustainability comes make the sustainable societies automatically things will be balanced we have to work for that otherwise 45 years have gone then uh, remaining things in 5 years can we do a change yes it is possible when you go down and work with the community sit with the community and the grassroots communities the bottom of the pyramid they are not big money mongers there is a food there is everything there is clean there is a disinfection so we can go for a self sustaining communities first so there is a possibility for, for that that's why the greatest strength is the community work with the community go down live with the community lot of things can be changed hmm and there there was actually uh, i mean there is there is a lot of comments as well as questions i don't know if you have managed to look at it you know ashish kotari professor samantha uh, ritika has actually asked a very interesting question about um, on the ground how can we ensure panchayats are not tools of oppression in the local community uh, i will park it there because uh, i think there are some similar sounding concerns as well but asim's question asim shivas's question um, um, on you know this whole race that is happening is i mean can one imagine that there is a race between a centralized government as well as threads of local governance that could actually be picking up now um can is it possible that you know that kind of a globalizing you know metropolitan economy on the one hand uh, versus the localized you know uh, the 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 economy the you know the network economy that you are speaking about is that race even remotely possible um, can that race capture this is the question of asim my find uh, interesting can that race capture the 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 soul of the workers who have actually gone back to their villages because roma made a mention about uh, you know these <clears throat> these villages having gone back and they at least feel like they have food sovereignty in 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 their villages uh, i saw sharad's uh, comments um, sharad really from atri um, sharad sir commented saying that well is that actually the situation can people really think that they have some food back home or food so security and sovereignty back home uh, i agree with the concern uh, because it is those villages that in a certain sense or the helplessness of those villages that draw people out but also elongo sir i want to ask the question about displacement uh, how because you know when villages are entirely thrown out for corporate land grab uh, what is is there actually can panchayats can even protect that um, those villages yeah that's where the, the, the greatest potential what you feel the, the the village people if they come out and they go and work and fight say about 5 15 kilometers or 20 kilometers away they may be defeated if the village community sit around in the village immediate thing is the, the the cultivation land immediate thing is the water body immediate thing is to stand for two months or three months or five months equip them silently equip them silently build them and there is food there is water there is a cow there is system three months we can withstand and like that every village there is a possibility in fact uh, there is a caste system and all that is one side but in tamil nadu i can say example tamil nadu Say twelve thousand five hundred panchayats are there. Four thousand panchayats are categorized as caste and caste based thing. Then eight thousand panchayats. In that eight thousand panchayat, absolutely four thousand panchayats caste neutral. Caste neutral. Another four thousand panchayats. The the caste in the say in fact the lower caste, so called lower caste or Dalit, they they will not be disturbed. Sometimes they even dominate. So that potential is there. Demonstrate here. demonstrate in these places then demonstrate not to suppress even others that's where gandhi comes in demonstrate that we people can crush that that should not be there demonstrate how positively you can make a change what is wrong come on and see it open it that kind of experiment is possible in panchayats otherwise i can organize go there and volunteer and sit in a community and the toil and moil for 500 families 
the whole seven years, 10 years, 15 years, I can make change. Whereas, panchayat is a systemic change. That's why out of 30% outstanding, I mean, potential Dalit dominated or Dalit rich panchayats are there. Then about another 30% neutral panchayats are there. Let us capture and create models and push it. There is a possibility. That's why this kind of pandemic and all, it gives opportunity for us to rethink. People are coming back. And another important thing is all the boys who have gone back to Orissa, who have gone back to uh, Bihar or anywhere, they are totally say, feeling, oh, Tamil Nadu building everything, we earned money. But uh, after when this kind of situation comes, the money may be there. That the money was there for three months, I ate. But people are helpless. They will not bother about us. They will not help us. Naturally, I have to go back. That's why with all the struggle, they are going back. They are gone. What is the hope available? Go with technology. Go with appropriate solutions. Demonstrate beautiful solutions in that place. And this is the high time then they will catch it up and they will stand there. They will not bother about globalization. Don't worry about the globalization. Localize it. Make the people to stand on them. Make them to withstand for three months even without the government, then there is a possibility of uh, reviving it. That kind of thing. It's not a, uh, li like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining. There is a possibility. That was Gandhi. That's what Gandhi did it. When Gandhi did it against a, a, a superpower, then what is wrong in doing this in, in, a, in, a, in a cluster of 10 villages, 20 villages, 100 villages, not for whole of the country. Orissa people, 100 panchayat around Bhuvaneshwar, let them demonstrate. Let the other people, if they listen and come and enjoy, let them enjoy. Or let them grow and wash out. That is, the, that is not our bother. That kind of thing. That's why the power of the people, believe the people, go and stand with them, work with them. Gandhi is an example. In fact, I, I listen. Hmm. Uh, it will actually be another session with you to actually understand uh, how we can um, reciprocate or, you know, uh, uh, a state which is, you know, like completely cracking up. You know, in, in Jharkhand, and I think this is a point that is put by our Bursa friends on the chat box, uh, when the Patalgadi movement started, well, Patalgadi movement can actually be attributed to be a reclamation by the Gram Sabhas or the Panchayats, and they are taking their collective decision. So in that sense, it is actually a reclamation of the local self-government me governance mechanism. But because it is not in the prescribed lines of the PRI, the Panjaiti Raj institutional framework, but it's more on the Adivasi traditional framework, you saw absolute violence against it. They were, the Patalgadi movement was dealt with as if it's some, uh, you know, Maoist movement for uh, establishing liberated zones, while the whole framework was an Adivasi framework of reclaiming local governance. So we do have a huge conflict there, but at the same time, I completely accept the fact that we need to replicate these experiments. We need to um, really seed them much, much further for, uh, you know, if it's fun, we, you know, the people will take it on. If it's not fun, as you correctly said, then, then those will uh, go down. Um, I, I would definitely would like to, you know, definitely have great longer chats with you on the whole question of replication, these experiments. Sagri, uh, I wanted to uh, come to you on that. You are also watching out for all the questions that you are seeing. There's a lot of questions that came in for uh, your sharing. If you could start with uh, uh, Sharad's question on uh, uh, when the PDS is pouring in cheap, I mean, you know, he actually said this uh, and saying that albeit the poor quality of PDS into villages, how does one still get the farmers to focus on food production? And what is the incentive for the people to even be? localizing the farm product produce economy uh, and i think we should expand that question in your context also to the livestock uh, issue and uh, what you said about you know uh, for example but my i definitely wanted to extend your point on uh, beef man and the impact but uh, i don't know how much time will allow you to answer all the questions and dr kirod actually spoke about um, uh, in assam due to the lack of proper marketing system Vegetable farmers are getting uh, I mean, lost in spite of having ma mass demand within the state or the entire Northeast states. Uh, 
except Assam, rest of the states in northeastern region, uh, Dr. Kirod says, uh, topographically not suitable for growing such things. How would be the proper management system for marketing such vegetable growers? Uh, there are, of course, many more questions, but I just wanted to take those and kickstart uh, uh, your second round. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, coming from the community experience and having heard the PDS, whenever we, you know, in community dialogues, the PDS is always flagged as the reason why we stopped growing food and went to uh, monocrops, right? The, the issue is that, okay, if we uh, take... Sagari, you will have yeah. to consciously go a little slow okay, for the okay, time. Okay, okay, right, right. Yeah. So, just tell me first how much of time I have to respond. About six minutes, you're right. Okay, <laughs> so in six minutes, here it starts. So the thing is that if we look at the public distribution system, until now it has primarily focused on rice. In a few areas, they are including pulses. But given that we are working with in areas, in ecologies, with communities, we're also realizing, and that's, I think, the power of where community organizers and organizing like us and like us organizers that's where we stand is that i go with ambedkar's uh, slogan of educate organize agitate and when we talk about educate it's not the traditional sense of a i know it all and i tell you education but we talk about popular education so we bring in prayer at that moment where we talk about creating these spaces where you have processes of critically analyzing your own situation. Let's take PDS. So what has PDS meant? How has it impacted you? How is it working off growing rice in your ecologies? How is this playing off against livestock which you're rearing? So I think what is most, most critical at this moment is when you, organ, when you get communities together and they come together and we are very clear in our heads, it is Bahujan communities because the criticality of caste playing such a powerful role. If we take Telangana, if we take Andhra Pradesh, you're talking about the Reddies and the Khammas really controlling not, but also land power, all right? And we're talking about the large mass of landless small marginal being Bahujan. So it's Dalit, Bahujan. And we, I'm not right now going to focus on Adivasi because it is a very different, we can talk of histories, we can talk of more just and equal histories which you can draw upon, whereas in a Bahujan context, we're talking about breaking down systems of injustice and breaking down systems of injustice, breaking down between the, 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 the graded uh, ladders of caste, which will divide the Dalits from the OBC, from the pastoralists, from the Muslim, is also the context you're working with. So therefore, when you look at something like whether it is PDS, whether it is today, there's an announcement by the government. Your in 70 lakh acres of land, there has to be cotton. In 50 lakh acres of land, there has to be, I think he talks of rice, right? It is completely then, this is the power that you're faced with. It is either PDS, it is either the states telling you already that this is what we're, and they've done it in the past, right? So what do you do then as an organizer? You start organizing where people critically reflect on this situation and they analyze it and they arrive at a realization as to the change which has to be made. So the, the, when you arrive at that realization of the change that has to be made, you will find a way that despite PDS, we're not saying that despite the PDS, you arrive at a realization that if I have to be resilient in my own household, if I have to be resilient within the community, we then have to re-diversify and refocus on food. It doesn't come in as a one-way change, 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 you have to change. No, because the realization has to come from within. It ha and that is a collective realization you do through critical analysis, through critical dialogue. And that forms organizing where actions then, collective actions emerge. And we've had examples of that. We've had experiences of that. Take the, I've been talking about um, let's take milk, for instance, right? These were small marginal farmers who also realized in the process, even in the COVID times, that, you know, if we only focus on milk, we're going to be really smashed because it's the resilience of being today, the means of production is not putting all our eggs in one basket. They've realized it. Whether it's climatic uh, challenges which lie ahead, whether it's pandemic challenges, whether it's economic challenges. For instance, 
just between 2015 and 2020, we had a massive crash of milk prices. That's because India has integrated its, its dairy markets with international markets. In fact, Amul is not a very, it's a, it's a cooperative corporate. And we have to recognize these differences. We can't any longer talk about farmers as a category. We in the lands talk about small marginal farmers because their positionality, their locationality, their interests, their class interests are very different from a middle and large farmer. And we really today need to really do this, you know, what is it? Separating the chaff from the, I don't know, whatever that expression is. So I come to the point that whatever be those challenges, we as organizers, it's up to us. When those small marginal farmer milk who had dairy, who had their, their, their cows, when they realized, they, we, they went through a process of realization that, okay, you know what, when we sell our milk, to a large private or a cooperative dairy processor, we are at the whims and fancies of that process. When the rates go up, we go up. When they come down, we come down. If they declare a milk holiday, we're at their mercy. So if we reorganize, once you get this aha moment, it leads you into organizing. And your organizing leads you to recognizing that if this is our produce and we're first doing it for our own food, so you look at your own food requirements in your community, in your household, it doesn't arrive. And I know that PDS is a challenge, but that's just the point. It's not just PDS as a challenge. And the challenge for us as organizers is how do you really build those dialogues so that you build the, the power of, when you say build the power of the people, it is building this power of the Bahujan, Dalit Bahujan Muslim communities to be able to do the analysis so that you're not going to just listen to what is told to you. You are going to reflect, you're going to get conscientized. And I think that conscientization process, we, in our experience, we've seen it translate into collective actions. So the pastoralists, for instance, the pastoralists have now organized themselves. They are doing these dialogues because they realize if we change our breed from a Deccani breed, which is a multi-purpose breed, to only a meat producing breed, we'll be dragged in to the process of where you just keep rearing your animals for higher and higher meat turnover and for longer and longer supply chains. Now that is only going to happen with one, as I said, this process of organizing, right? This process of, org this process of conscientizing, which, which translates into organizing. And we underestimate the creative potential of communities to come up with their solutions. So when we had, a we had a small dairy farmer from, from Netherlands come and talk to the community of, of the small marginal farmers doing dairying in Chittur, they began to think, because she said only one thing, you know, that unless you guys organize yourselves and identify what is the market that you can actually, and how, to what level is your livelihood going to be only dependent on milk? That's when they began to think, and that's when they realized, and they said, no, we're not going to market beyond 20 kilometers. The second decision now they still make is that we, can, we have to make conscious choices of shifting away from Jersey and Holstein Friesen to local breeds. Now, those are really powerful actions. The act of saying we are going to save our seed is the first act to get to liberate yourself from the power of the corporation. So the act of saving the seed the act of maybe learning a knowledge of how to rear your, how to, 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 to use draft animals again is actually when you have, it's a political act and that, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's much better. Yeah, okay, fine. So what I was saying is that I think it is extremely critical at this point that this, that A, that we recognize the caste, the caste resources relationship and we cannot, we can no longer just say that, you know, the entire, unless we actually provide spaces for Bahujan, Dalit Bahujan communities to come together. So it has to be a process of dialogue, of critical reflection, where people arrive at a realization and then take actions, right? And I think because there are so many forces, it's not only PDS, it is about state policies. I mean, I think apart from, and, and there was a question here about, you know, India is, the largest milk and meat producer in the world today. Now the question is, from where is, who owns the means of production of that meat and milk? 
increasingly the statistics are revealing to us that it is actually shifting to a more middle, middle large farmer base. That entire rosy picture that, you know, the marginal small landless still own the livestock is actually a myth. It's, it's slowly moving away from, and why is it moving away? Because where your milk come from, who owns the means of production as corporations, as dairy processors, as cooperatives, who are the cooperatives of the rich farmer, of the middle level farmer, of the middle large farmer. When those cooperatives are setting the, the game plan, then we, then you have to really be, you have to be, you know, you have to be revealing these, unraveling these. And that is the situation today. Milk, as long as your milk is going to be produced with having been delinked from agriculture, and a lot of the times that has happened, you are having 10 to 50 animals now reared by farmers. In, in poultry, the same thing has happened. A lot of these are contract farming relationships and arrangements. They all predate pandemic. It's part of capitalist economies of production and distribution. And so this is where we have to also recognize who is the base we're organizing. Who is the base we're organizing? What is the kind of reflection you're going to do? How much of that collectivizing? Then they build the power to be able to engage with the panchayat, with the panchayat system. Okay? Across Telangana, the, the dominant so the, the, the control of the panchayats is in the hands of the reddies. Mm. Reddies own the land. Sagari, you'll have to. So I'm just up. saying that um, this is, I think, uh, for me, it all boils down to the fact that as organizers, it's a process of really deliberating and discussing. And we have, and youth, and we have young people today who are actually able to lead these discussions and dialogues and come up with really creative collections. Because it's the power of imaginations of those who are part of the crisis, who, if we facilitate it, they find, also find the solutions and the, and the, the ways forward. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm really sorry. As I said, I mean, um, yes, of course, uh, I saw Nasrinji's uh, comment about each of these should have been a se separate session. And indeed, even in the future, I think, you know, be it fisheries, be it the forest uh, the link community along with the Adivasi communities, uh, the pastoral uh, communities and their issues, or that of uh, the the agriculture workers or agriculture communities in the ground, especially the Dalit community in the ground, the landless uh, labor and peasants. Each of them deserve very very diverse separate sessions. But here the effort was actually to hear these multiple concerns through some of the selected friends only. These four friends speaking today, comrades speaking today, in a certain sense are just. A representative section of many of the movements that are working in this. So there is no uh, claim from our side that you know uh, these are the only voices uh, on, on these issues. Of course, but at the same time, I think it is important that we had to bring some of these sectors together, both from the longer-term vision development process. And this is only a beginning in, in in a long journey. I feel, or this is just another stop in this long journey. I would want to quickly come to Jaisi Ratnam. We are really uh, running short and I'm sorry uh, uh, that we have probably not given that much time to the, the, the coastal and the fishing sector. Uh, Jaisoka, one is of course there are, you know, uh, Thomas Franco as well as Maria Dasan, uh, uh, etc. have asked about for, to, for your response on, for example, the Prime Minister Mansi Yojana uh, for instance, or uh, the Marine Fisheries Regulation Management 2019. These are things where organizational position of the National Fish Workers Forum is out there and, and, and friends can refer to those. Uh, there is a statement on the Matsi Yojana that is also out. Uh, if you want to definitely mention some of those, please do. Uh, but there are two specific questions. One is about the Muslim fisher folk who are fishing uh, uh, or involved in, in at, at Bara. Uh, so that's about a good question um, that Ashok Srimali has asked uh, regarding Gujarat. Um, I think you know other friends from or, or the Gujarat friends from the NFF may be in a better position to respond to that. But I think the larger question of where communalism has already been used in the coastal areas, how does it work? I mean, how does this further marginalization of the Muslim community uh, work is a larger question for us. And Yogesh uh, Pisolkar watching us on Facebook uh, says, Traditional fishermen are shifting to the tourism sector where there are favorable situations. And he talks about there's a need to educate, train, build their capacities, etc. Uh, 
but the question is how do you go about this tricky situation in most of the uh, most of the situations and that's the question that is posed to jesu um uh, comrade jesu i would like you to just take about 5 to 6 minutes and uh, and reflect on this before we go to roma for uh, the final comments from roma side we are, we are, in the whole session Hello. we are left with about just about 10 minutes yeah um this uh, pmss pmm sy scheme uh, yojana announced by uh, our prime minister um, nearly he has announced 20000 crores for fishermen um, he says he claims that it is for fishermen but uh, there are lot of gaps in it it really more, out of this 20000 crores 11000 crores activities are meant for marine inland cat, uh, fisheries and mainly for aquaculture and other 9000 crores for infrastructure development like uh, fishing harbors cold uh, cold chain and cold chain cold storages markets and uh, other things and then cage culture weed farming everything it is uh, what not all these culture uh, different forms of culture fisheries mentioned so the major chunk goes to uh, the allocation goes to uh, the promotion of uh, culture fisheries and not for capture capture they have mentioned about uh, infrastructure development Uh, like harbors and other things and most of the things uh, activities are already in nfdc so national fisheries development uh, board projects so they have just lifted that and uh, shown here so it is really uh, what to say um, it is like uh, um, saying that uh, you fishing community you have demanded for some uh, relief and for the relief matter they have not announced anything it's matter of they have just clubbed the ban period uh, uh, compensation which is given in the, especially in the east coast uh, they have g- given 5000 5000 10000 and they have said that there is uh, only 1000 rupees relief but whereas the uh, nf of national fish workers forum and the other unions have demanded for a minimum of 10000 to 15000 per month for as covid relief there is no mention about covid relief for the fishing communities in any of the announcements whereas they have gone in for um, un- forming the announcing the uh, national fishing policy to 2020 we, uh, b- when the national fisheries management and uh, ma- ma- management policy of 2019 is there now management bill is there now they have gone in for uh, national fishing policy 2020 so through this policy uh, it is really um, yeah, deep one thing is it is very much against not in favor of small scale fisheries and not in favor of fishermen fishing communities itself totally it is against their rights whereas uh, like pushing everything for deep sea uh, subsidies and other things so it's, it aims at uh, promotion of deep sea fishing vessels and culture fisheries um, and not uh, for promoting of or safeguarding the rights of small scale fisher folk in their terms so um, so the rights of the fishing communities are totally at stake both now the other thing is um, uh, when the, about gujarat yes uh, when we visited gujarat we found that the uh, muslim fishing communities in gujarat are really in a very um, the fishing conditions are very bad and without lot of uh, even land holding rights they are in some of the areas they are in um, what go, um, port areas which is which is not uh, their legal lands so in at any time they can be evicted they are uh, they are always living in that area it's most of the marshy lands where really people cannot live um, it's not it is unfit for living but for survival and for livelihood they are living there and fishing so we raised this questions we raised this question for the fishing community there uh, usman and others yes they are fighting for their right they are trying to get their uh, on one side they have to have livelihood on another side they have to have land for construction of houses and things whereas the entire area is taken for port development by the uh, gujarat and government and the central government so um, in that way they are displaced they are living in a place of uh, at any time they can be evicted true i accept the condition in certain parts 
are really bad in Gujarat. Because we went for the visit yeah. and we found that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think I have said that tourism, I didn't understand what it was a question. So the no, the, it, it, it is a question of the existing contradiction because, you know, people are looking at tourism as an option. But, you know, now uh, tourism being a tertiary sector completely stands uh, in, in a chaos because, you know, you're not looking at any tourism linked uh, livelihood for the next, <laughs> you know, who knows uh, how many months, if not years. No, no, tourism um, is not going this. Definitely, I accept. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, no, uh, Nazri Napa, who is here, and she's actually our South Asian uh, guest. Uh, guest here. Uh, I mean, I already said a welcome to her. She had actually put in a couple of very interesting points about how her concern is about how to counter the allure of money and greed. Uh, I would, uh, once Roma gives her concluding remarks, I will definitely request uh, Nazreen uh, uh, to, to tell us uh, a little more about it. But also your reflections on, uh, quickly, we are almost at the end of the session. Uh, but before that, Roma, uh, there are questions that are addressed to you. I mean, there are several questions that uh, actually touch upon uh, the whole question of natural resources and livelihood. Um, but... You know, on, on Facebook, somebody mentioned this question saying, how can climate resilience be built into livelihood regeneration? Uh, Susan Matthew asked this on Facebook. And uh, it's about climate resilience be built in, building into livelihood regeneration. And I think, you know, uh, the collective women's experience of the forest working movement and, and the union has been very rich on, on this point. Uh, Roma went up. Uh, do you want to address this in say five minutes yeah thanks Vijayan uh, this is uh, important to uh, respond you know uh, I feel that this crisis which has happened now is a climate it's a, it's a climate crisis this is an environmental crisis and it it it, it, it has resulted into it, uh, that crisis that we should it will uh, int intensify more in coming few days and the livelihood, the self, as our prime minister says, self-reliance and suspending all the labor laws and then saying self-reliance is one thing, but we talk self-reliance in another sense. The livelihood, uh, um, uh, freedom and security uh, will, is the answer for the climate crisis also, because it is that way, you know, it will, the more uh, the disparities has to go, the livelihood options, if there is a more struggle in, in that field, the social equality and social justice is very important. It, until unless that is addressed, you know, it is very difficult to uh, secure a very uh, independent livelihood uh, options for the people who are totally dependent on that. And also for a larger uh, society, which is struggling into uh, various kind of, uh, you know, uh, this market options which is coming up. So the question that came about the panchayats and I have not, I'm sorry, I have not seen any neutral panchayats in UP, Bihar, in entire northern areas. This is yet to see and I have not seen any single dominant Dalit uh, panchayat. That's a distant dream. These struggles are going to intensify in coming days. It was already there. It was already there and it is through the land struggle, through the struggle of the natural resources that we found that uh, in the uh, areas that we are working that women were able to um, bargain, collectively bargain. Uh, once they reclaimed their lands and from the forest department, from the upper uh, 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 big, uh, big farmers, from the feudal sections, from the companies when they opposed the big projects and all that. So it is uh, very, very, uh, uh, the, the struggle is very intense. The uh, power of the Gram Sabha, the entire democratization of these institutions is yet to be achieved. It has not, we have not achieved as yet and it's a very, very big struggle. Collector has no power to rule the district. How can a collector which has, does not have any constitutional power, they are ruling the uh, uh, district. It, sh it should be ruled by the Zilla Panchayat. There is all uh, four uh, tier structure that has not been uh, implemented at all. So it is also a struggle against this regime 
the struggle against the fascist regime and we need to uh, topple over all such governments and reclaim our political space too in order to you know uh, get a, a sustainable livelihood uh, 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 the options for our people so we need to organize how do we organize in this now post uh, covid times and where you know, there is a vast ghar uh, wapsi of the workers which are going back the we don't know what kind of tensions will grow in these areas and how it is going to be addressed how this will be uh, you know uh, being uh, it will uh, uh, emerge into a larger political fight so but the the attempt of this regime is suspending their labor laws and turning them into slavery and trying to again uh, force the bonded laborness it is actually pushing them towards maoism it will it can push it will it is a very very tricky and volcanic situation and the workers are no longer they are not um, you know uh, going to subject to slavery it is our, our firm belief and i believe in it and i believe in workers power they will retaliate they will fight back and the struggle will be very intense how is that we are going to address is my question also to all of uh, us you know how we are going to organize this and how we are going to organize the new force how we are going to you know stick to this the livelihood issue and how the this can be you know equitably distributed to all and uh, uh, how we have to build we have to build the workers council the collective process and the cooperatives and all these structures are very important we need to work on this but roma ben uh, also uh, you know on the one hand and elango is talking about uh, rebuilding trust rebuilding framework based on panchayat raj institutions on the other uh, the living reality of the feudal panchayat raj uh, implementation that you mentioned saying that you know in bihar up you are yet to see a village that is not structured and caste dominated in a violent patriarchal way um so in terms of trusting the institutions in terms of building our trust on this or our experimentational work engagement with these uh, how do you see the 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 resistance and trust on institutions uh, working roma we have uh, the, we are really trust uh, what elango is saying is correct also that we need to build up you know we there are a lot of is very positive that is one thing i really liked about him he is very positive there are resources there are people there are young people we have institutions it is not that i'm just uh, commenting that i have not seen neutral panchayats yeah. otherwise you know it is only option we have we have to work on the local governance but there are intense struggles in that and it is not that you know it's difficult also the subaltern communities the dalit communities tribals the muslim communities are no longer they are going to subject to repression or you know domination of the oppressors they are definitely fighting that you saw in ntca movement how muslim women who never used to come out they were on the streets and this really you know unnerved the whole government and they were really scared of this whole movement so that mm. is there and this is definitely going to now be a very big area to work and uh, panchayati raj institutions need to be strengthened that's why i said there is no uh, power of collector to hold the office they should be thrown out there is no constitutional provision for them they are all being governed by the colonial laws all these colonial laws has to go and panchayati raj institutions were uh, why why we are um, electing uh, jila dhaksh he has no power he only signs but have, have we ever heard that what powers he assumes what is naya panchayat doing what is village uh, panchayat you know uh, the pradhans are all working as two stooges of collector and the panchayat secretary so this has to be uh, what we want our self governance is also you know reclaiming that political space and that struggle needs to be you know taken ahead and it, a lot of uh, in uh, organization needs an organization building needs and we need to be, build a workers councils the workers the women need to be organized organization is very important without it is a really a class struggle as sagri has point, pointed out this is a big class struggle that will now we will see more of it in the uh rural and in the entire uh, area 
and especially in the, uh, the natural resources area. And only hope is the people community and who will save us from the climate crisis. The livelihood has to be, uh, you know, this, this whole natural resources has to be owned by the communities and they should not be treated as commodity. It is not for the commercial, it is not for greed, it is not for loot, it has to go. The companies, the governments which are again and again trying to sell it to corporation and bringing it, it will not work. It has the, our environment has come to a stagnation point. It cannot take any, anything, you know, that kind of a devastation any longer. It, we have to move back, you know. It is high time that it has to be reversed as our uh, workers are going to back to their roots. Even we have to go back to our environment in a natural uh, way. So this is very important. Uh, so this is what I wanted to say. The social equality and social justice is very important. The disparities have to be. Until as it goes, it is not, it is very difficult for to sustain. Yeah. Thank you, Roma Ben. Uh... Uh, Asim had actually, uh, I mean, I don't think it's particularly to Sagari alone, that particular uh, question and comment. Asim had mentioned saying that uh, the three prerequisites, as he said, for, you know, regaining local food sovereignty and kicking out the corporations. And I think all four of uh, the areas that you mentioned here uh, needs uh, some sort of uh, response from this, which is, I mean, the prerequisites, he said, are local community organizing, shortening supply chains and three help from the authorities be it local state or national level uh, the last source of that potential support can be safely ignored it is actually hostile to local regional food sovereignty but what about local and state government support do you envisage any way of convincing state and local governments to be responsive to the urgent need to kick out corporations can a state level food sovereignty plan be proposed in different states of the union to challenge the dispensations of the central government and the global cloud elites who continuously shape their agenda and imagination. I pose this almost as the final uh, question. I'm really, really sorry that we are not able to take too many questions. But just for, uh, just for reflections from some of you, because uh, we are all uh, in, in these experiments, in this, in this living, uh, lived uh, uh, opportunities of being with the people in the struggle, but also in building a certain kind of economic alternatives. And that's the whole effort of the webinar. Uh, but at the same time, uh, where do we see allies? Uh, do we see potential political allies? Do we see potential state allies? Uh, uh, is, is also a much important question, especially when it comes to uh, looking at the battle against bigger corporations that are constantly in the, in the I mean, you know, people are joking about it, saying that, you know, self-reliance that Prime Minister spoke about is about himself and reliance, which is Ambani Brothers. So, and I think that's the biggest challenge right now, even in the COVID situation, as we see. Quickly, all the panelists, I would like to start with uh, uh, Jesu. No, just say, it was not clear to me. Vijay? No, the question is about an alliance. Uh, who are the allies that you see? Uh, do you see, for example, in your instance, like Nagapatnam or Tamil Nadu, do you see the state as an ally in a certain way? Or is it a constant confrontation with that state? Then how do you, who, who can actually, who can you ally with in terms of building this anti-corporation, anti-authoritarian um, movement? Alliance with the state, I am not very sure because uh, we have always played a role to influence uh, with, by aligning with other movements, uh, other interest groups uh, to build um, a stronghold and solidarity among the groups to influence the state so that we uh, create a pressure strategy. That's what we have always done, even in the local governance. Not I am not talking about the elected panchayats also, not others also, even the traditional governance structures. Uh, through women, we have always tried to play influential role. Because women are not given any place in the traditional governance structures. The elected governance out of the law we are given. So always, uh, I don't think, yeah, I think that uh, building alliances with other interest groups is the way how we can strengthen ourselves in taking the issues forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Elango, sir, uh, would you uh, like to respond on that? 
no i i don't have at the present situation in tamil nadu uh, we don't have faith in uh, getting alliance with the government and the whole bureaucracy and all totally different but alliance uh, again yeah the self help group movement the women federations and the farmers federation and uh, this kind of people's movement uh, there is a possibility but uh, th- this covid situation after that uh, the difficulties uh the labor all the boys are gone uh, whoever uh, was here which is on all they are gone so it may be industry it may be big farming or maybe hotel everything they are going to struggle for labor so this is the time that they are working with the local communities local youngsters local team so there is a possibility of aligning but again again i want to emphasize for the whole of the country if this is stopped yes simply you know you go and talk to your uh, a self help group in a, in a kerala panchayat next day the the community get organized panchayat is organizing a meeting hey nice idea has come come on come on we will talk and they talk and they do it say so your own brother and in kerala is doing why not in tamil nadu why not in andhra why not in other place so let us go and learn let us go and sit there is a unless otherwise we believe and sit in the community all of us we have got faith in the community and uh, even the government doesn't feed us we have got food even the government doesn't provide power we can generate power we can we know how to live with 5 watt bulb instead of 40 watt bulb we know how to live with uh, you know run a small fan small ventilation with 5 watt or 10 watt fans instead of 40 watt fans so with all these things this kind of appropriating technologies and strong people's movement and to again food security food security this will create a big wave and this big way out for our people alliance with the government absolutely in the milnadu like states you know, they all boast and uh, maybe after after covid uh, there may be a chance for u turn <laughs> okay thanks a lot uh, sagari uh, quickly over to you there is there was another question that was from bhargavi uh, you must have seen that on the whole question of what is the future of indian uh, uh, pastoral economy uh, i definitely wanted to take that but i know that it's going to be like deadly uh, taking that at 116 117 uh, we are already overshot the time of the session by about 15 minutes thanks to everybody for staying on uh, Sagri, over to you. Uh, do you want to take that for a minute, and then yeah, uh, yeah. We'll I'll I'll first the respond to maybe I'll just talk about to the milk meat question. Today it is very clear that um, milk and meat. If you take milk, and I'm I'm going to keep meat, meaning sheep, goat meat, out of the picture right now. We're going to look at beef and milk. So beef and milk are like mirror images of the other. No, when you finish milking and the animal is over, then what do you do with an animal which is old or which is not producing has to be slow it is slaughtered and then you have beef the quite the problem right now is that the means of the way the milk is produced is increasingly getting more and more industrialized more and more as i said the means of production moving away from the small marginal to a much at much more middle level where it's a separation between the agriculture and the animal so it's animals on more like organized farms then you get into the trap of you need to feed those animals where you again there's long supply chains of fodder coming in concentrates coming in when concentrates start coming in then you need that means that land which should be put to food is put to maize is put to soya right so these are questions i will not be able to take it up more but it means that we have to really be relooking at the base of production and also for what for what intent and how that production is going to happen what kinds of systems of markets because today it's more and more centralized there are a handful of of players who are controlling the milk market similarly the the so called pink revolution is about a buffalo beef which is largely going in i mean in fact the beef in the come in the in the in the country is getting more and more expensive because and and you're putting out a whole lot of communities putting beef out of their hands because you have this export market which is also very strongly uh, entrenched in the hands of a few corporate powers so that's what i would like to just say and flag as far as meat and milk there's lots more we can talk about and maybe you can organize something next but coming to the food sovereignty 
questions and the state, right? Apart from, I think, Kerala and, you know, apart from Pinarayan who actually made a comment that, you know, we in Kerala have to start becoming self-reliant in our food. Because if you take a plate, I remember once I was in Trivandrum or somewhere and they told, I said, they said, you know, the plate you're holding, the rice is from Andhra, the fish is from somewhere else, the, the, the so there's nothing on your plate which is from Kerala. So I think there was a clear political commitment from Kerala, uh, po the political leaders that we have to over, we have a game plan to go back to producing at least part of our food over a period of time, have it self -local localized and produced in Kerala, et cetera, et cetera. Now, which other state has made that claim? In Telangana, they have every opportunity, but you've gone straight back into making an announcement that this Kharif period, we are going to buy back. So the state is putting in money. The state is putting in money and making a commitment. We're going to buy back from you cotton. We're going to buy back from you um, paddy and rice. We're not going to buy back from you maize. We need to understand that link to chicken markets, poultry markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is the situation here. You have a state, and we're going to put in. You grow vegetables. Interestingly, then I've been working with Kerala people, government and the panchayats. Interestingly, now all Kerala people, when they come to know, oh God, the, 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 the Coimbatore people are blocking the, the eggs coming in, the vegetable coming in. Oh, come on, let us sit. And yes, they are sitting, go there. All the panchayats, they are discussing. And money is there, land, fertile land is there, people's commitment is there. If the Kerala people work, they are working, they work out. Maybe in a year time, they will reach the self reliance in even whatever they need, whatever they need, because money, commitment, and discipline, everything is there. That's the beauty of Kerala. So this I want to say. In many villages, we are given the spark. The Kerala, the people have people blocked, that is a Coimbatore check post. Tamil people have blocked the lorries of vegetables. Oh God, then how long we will? That how long we will? That's really sparking. Mm. And things are coming up in Kerala. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Sagri, just quickly over to you, one yeah, minute. Yeah. So the, I was just making a final point about states. If you take the state of Andhra Pradesh, they have accumulated, they have, uh, agri they have uh, what do you say, harvested finances from the World Bank, from BNP Paribas, from all kinds of avenues to actually do quote unquote agroecology in the name of zero budget natural farming. But what is their intent? Their intent is to link them up to agribusiness. Their intent is that it's an outward flowing. It's not an internally building up from the bottom because if you build up from the bottom, Walmart, BNP Paribas, the World <laughs> Bank are not going to get their, have their interests met. So therefore you have states like this and there are a whole lot of models which you see coming up in Andhra Pradesh like backyard poultry. They're using models which are essentially caught, come out from industrial models. They're talking about unique breeders of poultry, whereas the resilient poultry breeding systems in, under, in, 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 in our countries have been about everybody being a breeder. Everyone has that knowledge. So you democratize. The foundations of knowledge have been in this way democratic. And now you're trying to, to specialize them. The caste system has been the, the horrific specialization, right? And the divisions and the... And so you're recreating this now in taking that and you're recreating it in a, in a, and the state is, is, is supporting it. Therefore, I don't trust the state. Unless you have clear political vision, and what is your vision? I mean, it, I mean, I can only say, and even if you take Sikkim with its organic markets, it's a horror story out there. It's all about supplying this so-called agroecologically produced organic safe food, but not for the one who is eating the food not for those communities. It's not talking about land. One of the worst land, uh, the, the, the areas which the worst kind of land distribution is in Andhra Pradesh. So when you don't have land distribution as your base of the structural change which has come in place, we cannot talk of states making any kind of, uh, making an alliances with states. First, you re reform your land issues. You're talking about giving Telangana state is inviting people saying we will inviting investment uh, from and saying we have all this land. We have these land banks. We're going to give it to you. Give it to people who are landless. Give it to the Dalit Bahujans who are landless. Start there. Then we mm. can talk about alliances with the state. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot, Sagri. I mean, uh, I'm really uh, embarrassed that, you know, one, 
I have uh, not been able to keep the session to time. Second, about the fact that you know we have given such short time uh, for uh, an amazing plethora of experiences that these four speakers brought in. I had actually thought of bringing in uh, Comrade Ashok Chaudhary or uh, some of the other friends to also reflect. Uh, but today we really ran short of time, and thank you uh, our constant support of friends like Ashok Da, Comrade Ashok Chaudhary of the All India Union of Forest Working People, when we were talking about this session. Uh, he said, from the union, it will be our women comrades who will be speaking. So it was uh, uh, Sukalu, the, Sukalu Didi's name that came first and then Roma's. Uh, thank you for the, 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 uh, the ownership by the movement. And I can see Comrade Nasreen uh, uh, applauding that. And I think that's important. Um, NFF was able to uh, provide us a, a, a Jesuratnam in that form of saying that, you know, yes, we want the fisherwomen concerns to be raised primarily. Um, Comrade Dilanko and Sagri, thank you very much. But before uh, we wind up the session, and I don't want to waste any time on uh, uh, my concluding remarks, I think um, Sagri's points are very, very uh, well concluding in itself. Uh, Nasreen, our, our friend from our neighborhood, uh, a true South Asian in a lot of ways, uh, Nazri Dapa from Pakistan, she has been based in London, India, Pakistan, all over. She has some amazing work that uh, happened in UP that she was very much experimentally taking the lead of. Um, uh, Nazreen, over to you just for two minutes of your valedictory comments. No, 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 hang on. Firstly, I want to say how exciting it is for me to meet all you wonderful people and how much I've learned from all of you, but also how empowered I feel. Because actually, uh, the whole uh, manner in which COVID was uh, handled here and seeing the so-called migrant workers just filled me with horror and, of course, uh, brought to the fore how religion, caste, poverty, class all intersect with basic rights that, you know, of livelihood and the right to life. And it didn't matter that these people were dying all over the place. And who knows who dies? Who knows what are the statistics? We actually don't know. So uh, it's amazing to meet people who are actually working at the grassroots and doing such wonderful work. I try and work in the three countries of South Asia, uh, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, because I'm anti-national. And uh, I'm actually anti-nationalism. I think it's uh, along with religion. I think nationalism does a lot of damage. So it'll be quite nice to have some discussions there. But I think I'll leave that for another session. I hope that all of us will get together. And then I will share with you uh, my work in village Mijwa, where Hindus, Muslims uh, live together. And it was actually the poet Kefi Azmi's village and how it was poetry and communism and Marxism that triggered the change. And I've been involved with the village for uh, 37 years now and uh, a village which didn't have a road, uh, which didn't have a school, uh, forget it, it had no electricity and today uh, it has a road, it has a school, it has a hospital, uh, it has job creation opportunities, etc. And of course, there's no Danga Fasad Hindu Muslim over there. And I think that it's a, it's a, it's a very useful and uh, invigorating uh, uh, paradigm and how uh, they actually arrived at it. So I leave that for the time being, but I'd like to leave it with saying a huge thank you to the organizers and for giving me the opportunity to meet all these fabulous people whom I hope I will be able to create uh, individual relationships with. Really uh, a, a wonderful and uh, hail, uh, human rights, democracy, humanism, decency, and the human condition. So uh, lots of COVID hugs to all of you and good wishes. Thank you very much, Nasreen Appa. Um, uh, we, I mean, you know, I, think, I think as soon as Nasreen said, I'm an anti-national, I could see 
uh, Admiral Ramdas and uh, Lolly applauding it and saying that welcome to the club of uh, anti-nationals. And I think some of you have been an inspiration. And I think even for this uh, series, there have been uh, the, the silent contribution of the applauses that has kept the series going, CFA, ESG, uh, Focus on Global South, the Research Collective, the whole host of organizations that have been holding it together. Uh, it had not been easy to run the process. Uh, uh, you know, be it Comrade Thomas Franco, be it Comrade uh, uh, Dinesh Abrol, uh, Ashok Da, Ashok Chaudhary. Uh, all of them will testify for the fact that, you know, be it other Delhi Solidarity Group friends. Um, they will all testify for the fact that running any process is difficult. And especially in COVID times, to run a, under lockdown, uh, uh, e-alliance building uh, has, has not been easy at all. Thank you all very much, um, um, especially the secret supporters, as I said, but also <laughs> friends from CFA who have been managing all the logistics. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, Priya, who has been coordinating this whole process. Um, Ashish, who had been, Ashish, Joe, uh, Majub, all of them who had been providing all the logistical support. Thanks a lot. But I would like to part with the words that Nasreen uh, reminded us about from Habib Jalib. Uh, which is a favorite of uh, quite a lot of us, and uh, you know, Dastur being the foundation of this, be it in resistance, be it in resilience, be it in uh, uh, in in reconstruction work, Sankarsh or Nirman uh, reconstruction work. I think it's important to remember Habib Jalib's Mehnahi Manta, Mehnahi Janta as as the foundational politics of our existence. Thank you all very much. Uh, Bye bye. Have a good day, and uh, please remember that next uh, next week Tuesday, uh, we will be taking forward this as the second session of the livelihood uh, with dignity assertion asserting livelihood with dignity. That will be more focused on uh, uh, handloom artisanal sectors because today we looked at Jal Jangal Jameen as the framework, and next session will be more on artisanal handloom handicraft. But also will bring in. Uh, what is referred to as alternate medicine, which is actually not alternate medicine, which is actually the traditional medicine of communities. Um, cases from Jharkhand, for instance, etc. The Oman Mahila Sangha Friends case, etc. So uh, there will be friends from the Handloom Weavers uh, Unions and, uh, and other Adivasi groups, etc. So we, please, please uh, do check up senfar.org if you have not registered already. Uh, if you have registered, then definitely you will receive a mail with the Zoom link, etc. But also, I think we should reach out to more people. Uh, we have surely had less number of people at, uh, today. And I think something to do with South Asia is also our stardom for uh, you know, uh, the, the big speaker league. And I think we are happy as an organizer, as, as part of the organizing league, we are very, very happy because I think today has been really, uh, uh, truly uh, inspirational day in terms of the session. And thank you all very much for participating in this. Bye-bye.